Good morning. Uh, I know I've already went through this, but I'm Captain Lamb Wright. I'm one of the EMS captains. Um, and today I will be talking to you uh, about pacing. So I'm going to kind of direct this more towards some of the back, some of our medics. But for the EMTs in the crowd, it's very important for you to know this as well so you can assist the paramedics. And remember, I mean, we say this all the time, but it's all a team effort, right? So if you're an EMT and you're noticing something isn't getting done or something should be happening, it's okay for you to say, hey, hey, did you see this, right? Because sometimes paramedics can get so many different things on their mind. So it's good for y'all to know what to expect and what they're gonna need, okay? So uh, I'm an EMS captain, like I said, and one of my responsibilities as an EMS captain is to uh, kind of make sure we're doing everything that we need to be doing on the EMS side. So um, we're looking at calls, making sure we're following our protocols, making sure our protocol still makes sense and it's something that y'all can actually do, right? <clears throat> so we had some instances where we weren't being very successful in pacing. So we went through a whole year review and kind of found out that, oh man, we are not good at this. So we have to fix it. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Talk to you about our transcutaneous pacing here in Sarasota County. So first we're gonna talk about some statistics and they are gonna sound pretty terrible, but that's why we're here, right? Then we're gonna talk about why we're doing these things wrong, okay? Uh, we'll go over some tips and tricks on how we can make this better. We'll have some practice, so we'll go through a bunch of rhythm strips so you can practice and see the difference between recognizing before and then recognizing after. Hopefully, we'll, we'll get that done. And then we'll have some final thoughts and reminders about pacing and other things if pacing doesn't work, per se, or something. So, all right. So let's go through our statistics. So again, we went through basically a year and how this really came up is we saw some cases that weren't successful and we looked down them close and said, oh, that looks like it might be, why didn't they get it right? Maybe other people are doing this wrong too. And then we went back for an entire year and found 32 cases. So if you think about how many EMS runs we have in a year, we have about, I don't know, 55,000 EMS only runs. And only 32 of the 55,000 we're pacing, so we don't really do it that often. So it's understandable that we might not get it right because we never do it. So of those 32, we only had six that were actually successful that we could determine, yep, we definitely got what we needed to get out of this procedure. That's not a very good percentage. Imagine if we only started IVs at that percentage or we only innovated that percentage. That's a 19% success rate. Not great. Uh, so there were 20 unsuccessful. Four of them, we were unable to determine whether it was we didn't get a good rhythm strip or they transitioned to another rhythm before they could actually get pacing going. Four, we weren't able to recognize. And then two, they did exactly what you're supposed to do is where they started pacing, didn't get it, <clears throat> and then moved on to something else, recognizing that they didn't get it, okay? All right, so here's the big deal. Why is it so important that we get pacing right? All right, so of the 20 people that we thought we were pacing but we weren't actually pacing, three of them were innovated. So we took a patient that was in a third degree heart block, thought we were pacing, and then innovated. So, medics, is that a very good thing that we're innovating somebody that's in a third degree heart block? No, not, not great at all. Two were innovated and then they subsequently lost their capture and went into cardiac arrest. So there were two patients that, hey, we're good, we're gonna go ahead and try and innovate and in that process they died. And then two other ones, just basically they thought they had capture wrote it out, and then they all they, they died, right? So it's kind of a big deal. This is what we're trying to avoid, is thinking we're doing something correctly, taking another step, and doing harm to the patient. So that's really what we're here to avoid. One thing to take away from this, especially for the paramedics, 
is there was no correlation between years of experience and getting it right. So we had people that were brand new that were getting it wrong. We had people that had been here 20 years getting it wrong. We had FTOs that were getting it wrong. So it had really nothing to do with, oh, well, I'm new. It's okay if I didn't get this. It's not, I'll get it later in my career. No, everybody was having issues with it. Right. Questions so far? No? All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about what's going wrong. Why are we doing this? Why are we so bad at this? And there's a bunch of different reasons. And we're going to get into each one of them. We're going to talk about our energy selection and where we start at. Uh, we'll talk about our training. We'll talk about what we do in training. And then we'll introduce two new concepts, phantom capture and false capture. And I'll go over those on what we're actually seeing and what those are. We don't actually realize what we're getting. All right. So when it comes to energy, <clears throat> the average of our success was 120 milliamps. So of those six, if you took the average of them, it was 120 milliamps was the average. And that average is pulled down because of this 90. Most of them were above the 120. But because of this frail old lady that got blasted at 90 milliamps, well, she pulls the average down. So you, it's going to take a lot more than what you actually think it does. Okay. <clears throat> The average on our failures, so those 20 that we really didn't get at all, it was 99, basically 100, okay? Basically 100. So we we're very low on our energy level. And we've had some in there, and you'll see subsequently through some of these strips that they were thinking they were pacing at 45 milliamps, and that is not anywhere close to enough to where we need to start at, right? Because of this, if you look at needing 120 and you remember what our old standard was for our machines how it started when you paste you know, turn the machine on and it would start at zero on the energy and you would ramp up if you turn the dial how many did it go up how many milliamps did it go up the dial was five and the button was ten good so the dial was five and the button was ten right so think about you're in the back of a, of a rig You've got someone there that's that circle on the drain, you're going to pace them, and you turn it on, and to get to 120 milliamps, you would have had to turn that dial 24 times. 24 times. Click. Do I have it? Click. Do I have it? Click. Do I have it? Right? So you finally get to a point where you go, well, I have to have it now. I've turned this thing like 15 times, and we still weren't getting it. So that's why all the machines now are set to where when you hit that pacing button, it launches at 80 beats a minute, and then it goes at 80 milliamps right out the gate. So be prepared. The old way we're used to is you hit the button and like, all right, you're gonna feel some a little bit of pain here. No, right when you hit that button, it goes, and it starts at 80. So to get to that 120, we really don't have to go that far, right? So everybody knows that. Questions? <clears throat> training. So training is a big deal when it comes to pacing. And I'm at fault for this myself because I've trained a lot of the paramedics in paramedic school. Right? If you look up here, this is a strip from the mannequin at school where we are trained. And this is what pacing looks like on the machine. Right? You gotta remember the machine is not actually looking for the energy that's coming through. The machine is just it is just looking for a certain amount and then it changes the rhythm strip to something else. So it's not actually looking and seeing the energy passing through like it does in real life. So we get this and it just looks clean and it just looks like nothing's going on. And what do we tell you in school? You see a pacer spike and if anything happens after it, Oh, that's your capture, right? You're looking for something happening. And there's nothing happening after it. So you think, oh, we're, we're good. We've got to keep going up. That's not how it looks in real life. I can't duplicate it unless someone wants to volunteer to lay down and put some pacer pads on your chest and get blasted. And there is a slight chance you'll go into cardiac arrest. But that's okay because we can fix that too, hopefully. 
right? So no one's gonna sign up for that, so we can't really duplicate what it looks like in real life. So this is like the best we got. Down here is what our R simulate is, is what we use to train our paramedics here. So same thing, basically. It's just showing you a little bit of energy here, and it's, it's kind of monitoring and waiting for you to get to a certain value, and then it just switches the rhythm. That's it. So you can see that this is not how pacing looks in real life. So you're expecting something different than what you're actually seeing. All right. So now to like the meat and potatoes of everything that's going on. Phantom capture. This is kind of a new concept. All right. So what phantom capture is, is basically we have a waveform after a pacer spike. Right? And what that waveform is, is it's getting the last little bit of the electricity passing through the body that we're applying, right? So it's the end of the electrical energy from the pacing impulse. So naturally, I have two pads here. I'm shooting electricity through. So those pad, those patches that are on their body are going to see that. They're going to see that energy. And we interpret that as an actual QRS complex, but it's not. So you think you have something, but you really don't. All right, so this is kind of what it looks like. So if you go through school, we tell you, hey, you turn the machine on, you start turning it up until you see something after each and every pacer spike. All right, so if you look at it, we have our pacer spike here, and we have something after it. We have a pacer spike and something after it. And this is occurring after every single PR, or every single pacer spike, right? So you see that, oh, we're good. Especially when the patient's sitting there screaming and telling you, oh, this hurts. Oh, cool, man, I think we're good, right? But all this is, is the return of the electrical energy. It's just seeing the end of that impulse passing through the body. Another example here. Another example here. Same thing, I've got this thing happening after each pacer spike. Looks kind of like maybe it's a QRS complex, so we should be good. Same type of thing here. You notice, 50 milliamps, that's it. And I forgot to tell you that every one of these rhythm strips, if I go back up, every one of these rhythm strips that I'm showing you is the last documented rhythm strip after they stated or confirmed that they had capture. So someone has this at those levels and thinks, I'm good. Right? Unless I specify and tell you that we're going through a line, all of these are the last rhythm that they gave us to show us that they had capture. Right. Same thing. This one's a little bit more deceiving because you see this big, like, wide thing going on. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's got to be it. It's got to be it. All right. So how do we avoid this? How do we avoid getting tripped up and seeing this phantom capture and interpreting it as actual capture, right? So what we have to do is we have to understand what the machine is seeing how your monitors work and what the machine is seeing and how it sees it, right? So does everybody know that you have to have the four lead on to pace? Because you can't monitor and deliver energy through the same paths. So you have to have both set up. It's so important that if one of those pops off on the bottom, it will stop pacing and wait. It will wait, okay? So, what the machine does is it actually knows, okay, I'm going to deliver this energy right now. So I'm going to see this huge impulse, so I don't want to see that. I just want to see what happens after. So the machine essentially closes its eyes and stops monitoring for a split second. Much like, imagine you're in a room and it's dark in the room, and in the distance you see like a little glowing light, right? And you're looking for that light. And then somebody walks up in front of you and shines a flashlight in your face. What's going to happen then? What will happen? 
you'll shut your eyes and it, your eyes will get all whited out, right? And then you won't be able to see anything for a couple of seconds. That's not what we want. So to prevent that, right before someone was gonna shine a light in your face, you would just close your eyes and then open them after the light's gone so you can then see what's going on in the distance. It's the same phenomenon. As the machine essentially kind of shuts its eyes for a second and then as time passes, it opens them back up so it can catch what's happening on the backside. But when it opens its eyes, it just catches that return coming back. So that's what you're seeing. All right, just like this. So the machine delivers an impulse. It stops monitoring and looking for a split second. Remember, this is happening instantaneously. And then picks back up here and sees the return back to baseline. That actually got me? Good. All right. All right. So what should it look like? What does a normal QRS look like? A normal QRS, especially if it's not on the normal pathways, is going to be wide, bizarre, and it will also have an equal and bizarre in size T wave following it. All right? So if you look at this one, we have this relatively narrow QRS. Then we have this little, not even really a T wave, it's just like a little hump right here. Remember, T wave should be almost an equal size to the QRS. Then you go over to the one on my left, and you see how it's wide and bizarre. You see how we have this big, huge T wave, right? Can everybody notice the difference between the two? Yes, sir. Can you see the difference between the left and the right? This is all the same patient. I'm pacing, don't have it. I'm pacing, and I have it. All right. And for you medics, you can also see something that really helps us out in that pleth wave right there. But we'll get to that in a minute. We'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> same thing. One on the left, one on the right. Um, is no capture, very narrow, no T wave. And then the one on the far side over here on my left is wide, bizarre, big T wave. Everybody see the difference? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Any questions with that? Medics, you good? How do you avoid that? Though? Do you just recognize it? Yeah, so it's all about recognition. Understanding that what you're seeing, knowing like, okay, I should see this return back. There should be something here. But if it's real, and it's actually a QRS, it should be wide, bizarre, and have a T-wave. And then we'll give you, later on, we'll give you a bunch of ways to figure out, okay, I got this, 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 and this. All right, the next concept we have to talk about is a little different, this is false capture. And so what this one is, is you have a QRS complex after every pacer spike. And it is a definitive QRS complex, but the QRS complex is not related to the pacing impulse. So they are completely independent of each other, but they look close enough that it looks like one is causing the other. Right? In addition, you'll see that when we get this false capture, it's also pacing at a much slower rate than what we have the machine set at. Right? All right, so what we have here is basically what false capture looks like. We have a pacer spike, and then we have a QRS complex. Nate, how do I know that that's a legit QRS complex? How do I know? Narrow. It's narrow. How else? Right, that's what these little spikes are for. Is the spikes are those that four lead picking up your underlying rhythm and it's identifying your complex. So the machine is identifying that something else is happening. When we pace and we get success, there are no there are no triangles over the successful capture of QRS. Right? So it's picking up what's going on, underlying, all right? And you can see 
that it's it's set much slower and going much slower than what we have it set at. Now here's another one. Right, we have a pacer spike, we have a QRS complex, right? So naturally, if I'm a paramedic and I'm following what the school tells us to do, they say, hey, see a pacer spike? I see a QRS complex. I reach down and I feel for ephemeral, and I bet you they have one. I'm good to go. Good to go. Right? But you're not good to go. You haven't actually done anything yet. Another one, same thing. Pacer spike, there's a QRS after it, pretty much in every single one of them. And then it continues on, and, but it's very slow compared to what it should be. All right, so how do we avoid this? So the last one, and our phantom capture, we had to understand what the machine was seeing and how it was seeing pacing. For this one, we have to understand what the machine is set to do do when it's pacing, all right? Does everybody know that our machines are set on demand mode? You know what that means? Right, so what that means for everybody else is the machine will watch your underlying rhythm and if it goes faster than what we have our machine set at, our machine will stop and let you take over and do your own thing, which is great. It's actually a really great feature. So hypothetically, if you have a heart rate of 30, we start pacing you and get your heart rate to 80 and then your heart rate takes over to 120. Well, we don't wanna be blasting you at 80 and you going at 120, so the machine will just kinda of watch and be in the background waiting for you to drop back down and take over again. So it's a great feature. <clears throat> the problem is, is that it leads to a very big problem while we're trying to get capture on our machines. Okay, so what I want you to do here so I want you to tell me, for the paramedics, what is the rate of our pacing <clears throat> on this strip? Now this strip in total is not a six second strip, but between this red line here and these arrows, that is six seconds. So Nate, tell me, what is our pacing rate on that strip? Really, really slow. Um, should be at 80, but it's not captioned because it's every other so long so it's like 40 ish probably. Right, so we would go here. One, two, three, yeah, three hundred. Four to five, depending on the, uh, four to five, right? And then we just multiply that by 10, so we're getting 40 or 50. Ish, yeah. Right? So the pacing rate that it's actually going at is 40 to 50. Right? But up here, it says that it's going at 80. Right? It says it's going at 80, but it's only doing 40 or 50. So there's something wrong. One of the misconceptions about pacing that has come up is that the pacer works as a support system. So if you're doing 40, the machine will only do 40 to get to 80. That's not how the machine works. The machine says, I'm going to go at 80, and that's what I'm going to go at. That's what it's set to, right? But for some reason, it's not doing that, and there is a reason why in this particular case, okay? So if we look at this right here, we have a pacer spike, QRS, they're kind of far apart, right? And it continues this pattern. So what we notice is that we still have this underlying rhythm going on. So the, the heart has not received enough electricity to change its course. It is still doing whatever it was doing underneath. Okay? So remember, the machine has to take a pause to see if you are taking over on your own. So the machine delivers energy, it waits, right? it opens its eyes back up and waits, and it sees this QRS complex and it says, hey, are you taking back over? I gotta, I have to step back and watch you for a second. And it watches you just long enough to where your next beat should fall to maintain a heart rate of 80. And when it doesn't, the machine fires again. And then it waits. It's 
that's all, you're taking over? You, is that you? Oh, no, I gotta go. And so we get in this pattern of waiting and waiting and waiting, right? That's why it looks so rhythmic is because it's doing the same thing. So it's gotta wait after every single QRM, right? All right? So does everybody understand what's going on here? Now, you might ask, well, how do I fix this? You fix it by just increasing the energy and getting to the point where you will fully take over, right? When you fully take over, these things will not be in there. Those extra beats will not be in there because the heart won't be ready or it, it won't have enough time to get to the point where your own beat takes over. It will just continue at 80. Does that make sense? Right. All right, so let's go over some tips and tricks, and this is very important. And now this is some of the EMT portion. Y'all could do some of these things yourself without the paramedics even having to tell you. They're very simple, some of them, right? So, if only there was a way to determine if blood flow is getting to the extremities, right? So how can I determine if I'm actually getting blood flow down to right here? Who can tell me a device we have <laughs> that could help us? All right, let's go to the EMT. What, what do we have on our rig to determine if I'm getting a good blood flow down here? The pulse ox, right? The pulse ox. Should be on every patient anyway, but it is vitally important when we start pacing. Because right? I can put it on and I can tell how many times I get a pulse down here. And if I get a pulse down here, that means I have a pulse here. And if I have a pulse here, what's my underlying blood pressure probably? 90. At least 90. Good to go. All right, so use our pulse ox. I'm gonna go through a list of rhythm strips here. And I don't even want you to, like some of you, you don't even have to focus on the actual EKG. So for the EMTs, I just want you to focus on the pulse ox. Paramedics, I want you to focus on both. But even just the EMTs, you tell me when we actually have full capture here, right? So here's the first one. Here's the first one. We have a really slow rhythm going on. This is prior to pacing, okay? Um, this appears to be I don't know if this is a second degree type two, which I think it might be. This might be an extra P wave in here, but I don't know, but it's very slow and it's one of the bad ones. So we have to do something about it. So we decide we want to pace, right? You can also see they do have our pulse ox on and it does correlate pretty much with each QRS. Now remember, when you get the heartbeat, it takes time for it to actually get down here, the pulse. So it is not straight up and down, it's actually sideways. So this correlates with this. This with this, this with this, right? And the, the lower your blood pressure, the farther they're gonna get apart because the longer it takes to get down the finger, right? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So we're good to go. And the machine's even telling you up here on the top right that we have a heart rate of about 40. All right, good, everything's matching up. Okay, so now they start to pace. Now they start to pace, so they, they are at 60, so this was prior to us changing to 80 and 80. So it's at 60, and they have it at 70 milliamps, and they start turning it up. Do they have capture yet? No. No, like I still have these, the pleth wave matching up with the original beat right here, right? So we don't have it yet. We don't have it. And you can see in the top right corner, now you don't have access to this information. This is printed for the EMS captains. But you can see that the pulse ox is still saying 42. What should it be saying? 60. 60, it should be saying 60, and it's only saying 42. Okay, so we don't have it yet. So now we're here again, and that's a really good puff wave. And again, that plus wave is only 43. Now they've increased their heart rate a little bit to 70. Not sure why. Probably because they are now at 130 milliamps and this person is not captured yet. So they're getting to the point where they, you, you can 
kind of tell they're getting a little antsy about it. All right, I got to do something because this isn't working. All right. What about now? What about now? Yeah. Yeah. Paramedics, can you see that we do have this definitive change? Now, I don't have it everywhere yet, but I have a pleth wave that correlates with every QRS complex. So I know that I have a pulse rate of about 80, and it's set at 80, and it's matching up. So this is like one of the gold standards right here. I have it. You didn't even need to see the EKG to know that. I could have blocked that out and just showed you this, and you would know, okay, it went from 40 to 80. Something obviously had to change. Now imagine if you didn't have that information, how hard it would be to, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure I got it, I don't know. That's why it's so important to put on the pulse ox. And as EMTs, y'all can just go ahead and put the pulse ox on. If you see it's not on, put it on, knowing that we're going to need it for this stuff. This was all the same patient we went through, right? Um, you'll see up here too, if I go back, they eventually went with 80 beats a minute and we're able to get capture at 120. So what they did, which is exactly what we want you to do, is you march your way through. If it's not working, cool. Change what you're doing. And they stopped, turned it off, turned it back on, walked through the process again, and were able to get capture where they need to be. You just don't want you doing the same thing. Be like, well, this has got to be it. No. All right, so that was tip number one, which was your pulse ox, use it. Tip number two is, is the tracing uniform? And by uniform, I mean we have a pacer spike, we have a QRS complex, and then there is nothing else in between the next pacer spike and the previous QRS complex. And it all kind of looks the same. It all looks the same marching through. There's nothing going on in between beats. Right. Up here, this is the original rhythm strip, okay. and you can clearly see our rhythm up top is very slow. I don't know if that's a third degree, I don't know if that's an idioventricular, all I know is that that is not good. That's bad. And we have to do something about it. So down here is the strip where they said, hey, we're good to go. I'm pacing at a at 60, I'm at 130 milliamps, I should be good to go. But what do you notice? Right. You notice that this is not gone. This is still here. It is still marching along, doing its own thing. Meaning, the energy you are applying is not enough to change the course of what the heart is doing. The heart is still doing what it was doing and you can see it marched off on the rhythm strip. So if you have capture, those go away because the next beat is coming from the pacer before the heart is ready to do its own thing. Make sense? All right, examples. So if you look, pacer spike, QRS, wide bizarre, right? And then it's relatively uniform in between each one. There's nothing else happening. They all look relatively the same, and it all marches across the rhythm strip. Same thing in the one on the bottom. There's no extra beat popping in here. There's no triangle right here that's popping up saying, hey, there's a beat underneath. Those all go away once you have full capture. If you don't, and they're popping off in between, you have to continually up your milliamps. All right. The next one, does it change shape? Does it actually change what it looks like from one to the other? On this portion, we have a pacer spike. We have this little phantom. Remember, this would have been the phantom beat right here. And then this person might say, oh, we're good to go. And they turn it up, and then it goes to this. 
Do you see the difference between the two? Right? Yes, sir. This is the same patient. They were here, then they went to here. There was a definitive change in what it was looking like. Now all the way over here, you see the pacer spike, you see that phantom beat right there. Then you look at the one down below it. The only difference between the two really is the depth. The one on the top is not quite as deep and is not quite as long as the one on the bottom. Why do you think that is? What do you think they did? They just turned up the electricity. Right? So if there's more electricity, it's going to look bigger. Right? So you wouldn't expect going from over here to down here for there really to be any difference. It doesn't look any different. It's doing the same thing. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So with all those tips, we're actually going to put them into like a little check sheet, a little chart. So, Mary Kate, when you were learning, I'll put you on the spot here, right? When you were learning how to do EKGs in school, how did they tell you to do them? How did we teach you how to do EKGs in school? Right, so what, like the first step was rate, and then rhythm, and then we would march down a five-step process, right? And once you got to the end of that process, then you made your determination on what was the rhythm gonna be. And it wasn't until then. You couldn't just go to step one and go, okay, cool, uh, step one says it's irregular, so it's this. You can't do that, you gotta go all the way through. About 12 leads the same way. We started, you know, ABR and lead one, and then is it wide, and then you go to B1, and then we could, there's a process to march your way through. We've done the same thing here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through some practice and we are gonna go through this box, this checklist for every single rhythm strip to determine, hey, are we good or are we not good? Right. So the first one is change in shape. Now, every rhythm strip is not a changing environment, it's static, so I can't show you the progression through. So you won't really have an answer to that one but we always want to make sure that we look at it and say, hey, did it change, all right? The next one, we'll look at the T waves and we'll look at the QRS, make sure it's nice and wide. Are we going at that rate? Are we pacing at 80? Or is it pacing at a much slower rate than what we're intending? Is it uniform? Does it look the same all the way through? And do we have a matching cleft wave? All right, so let's go over the first example, okay? Let's look here. Nate, I'm going to call on you for this one. All right, so we're going to walk through and use our little check sheet. All right, first we're going to go through a change in shape. Do we know? We don't really know. We don't really know if it's changed from what it was to where it is now, but I want you to think about that every time you have one. All right, so we don't really know. Is there a wide and bizarre QRS or a big T wave associated with this? I don't see one. No. I see these little return these little bits of energy, but they're not real wide. There's no big associated T wave with it. So I would say no. We want it to be going at 80. Is it going at 80? I don't think so. There are moments where it starts to get in line, but then there's big gaps and whatever, right? Right? So it's not going at 80. Is it uniform? Meaning, it kind of looks the same all the way through. There's not extra beats happening in between pacer spikes. Nate, what do you think? It's a hot mess. It is a hot mess. It is a hot mess. So that would be a no. And do I have a matching pleth wave with? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Right. So, what do you think, Nate? We do not. We do not. We do not. No, we do not have capture. Now in that upper right hand corner is when I reveal it, is what the pulse ox is showing you. Now, does everybody know the difference between heart rate up here and pulse rate? Do we know the difference? Not know the difference on what they are, but where we're getting them from? Do you Exactly, yes. 
The heart rate is the four leads, so it's whatever your four leads picking up. And the pulse rate is what we're getting from the pulse ox. Now, you can get this information in real time from your machine while you're pacing. It's just very difficult and you probably won't think about it. But remember, everything's color coded on your life pack. What color is pulse ox? Blue. So if I were to have everything off and I would put the pulse ox on, the heart rate would pop up in the top corner, top, when you're looking at it, top left corner, and it would show you a blue heart rate, which means it's coming from the pulse ox. If it was coming from the EKG, it would be green, which is what it normally is. So understand the two different, right? So the pulse rate is what it's actually feeling down here. And we have it set at 80, but it's only rocking off at 55, so we obviously don't have that. That's not full capture. All right, next one. All right. Mary Kate, let's go with you. All right, so we first think about our change in shape. We want to think, hey, did it change when I turn that dial or I hit that button? Did it change shape or look different now than it was? We don't really know. All right. Is there a wide and bizarre QRS or a T wave associated with it? You can answer honestly. It looks a little wide, right? Like it looks kind of wide. You look at that and you're like, well, that is wide. So that might be a yes, right? I don't know. So maybe it is, maybe it's not, okay? Are we pacing at the selected rate? Meaning, is it going off at eight? It doesn't look like it, or I guess 70 in this situation. It doesn't look like it to me, right? Nope. Good. Is it uniform? So this is another kind of a depending on your perspective. So it looks the same through each one, but we have these extra beats happening in the middle that the machine's picking up on, right? So those shouldn't be there if we actually have capture, right? So it kind of looks uniform, but not the way it should look. And do I have a matching pluck wave with it? No. No. So do I have capture? Nope. Nope. Okay. You, pro you might remember this one from earlier. I have very few successful cases to show you. So you might see some repeat offenders here. Okay. All right. So we look here. Let's walk through this. We don't know about change in shape, but you kind of get a glimpse, right? You kind of get a little glimpse of what it has changed from. This looks like we might have missed it. And then this looks like we might have it. And you can see the difference between the two. You would expect, if I go from here to here, something else happened. Something else happened. Is there a wide bizarre T wave, uh, wide bizarre QRS, or a large T wave associated with it? The ones that it looks successful, yes. Yeah, right here. Right? This whole doohickey going on right here. Is it going at the selected rate? It says 80, and it looks like it's marching across here at about 80. So I think we could. Is it uniform through? Eh, that's also a perspective thing. I would say yes for the ones that we actually have captured on there, if it's getting it. Right? So I would say yes. And do I have a matching plug with? Yeah, sure. Right, right. I have a matching plug with. Good. So what would you say? We have it or we don't? We have it, we have it right? So we have it. Now if you look at our pulse ox number up there, it says we're at 80, and we're pacing at 80, so there you go. All right. Don't know about change in shape. We want to think about it, but we don't exactly know on this one. Is there a wide and bizarre QRS and a big T wave? Yep. Are we pacing at the capture uh, selected rate? 
Yeah, I mean, it's saying it wants to go at 80, and it looks like it's going at 80. So we're good. Is it uniform? Anything else happened in between? Yeah. All right. It's uniform. And do we have a clock wave? Yeah. This one's almost textbook right there, right? The only thing that they're lacking is maybe chemography down here. Other than that, this is pretty much textbook how it should look. All right. And our pulse ox kind of shows us that, yep, you are definitely getting a pulse down here at what you should be. All right, change in shape, don't know. Wide and bizarre QRS or a T wave? No, nope. Is it pacing at the selected rate? So is it going off at 80? No. 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 Is it uniform in between? Meaning there's nothing happening in between the pacer spike and the preceding QRS, right? So if we're thinking this is the QRS, then there should be nothing happening in between these two. And there is. And the machine's picking it up and showing you, hey man, your heart's doing its own thing down here. And that shouldn't happen when we're doing this, right? And then is there a matching plug wave that matches, all right? Good? Not good. Good, not good. So, no capture on this one. All right. And this is a weird one because it says 87, but there's a lot of movement going on in that machine. Okay. All right. Going through quickly here. Don't know about a change in shape. Does it have a wide bizarre QRS with a T wave? No. No. Is it going at the selected rate? It's supposed to be going at 80. No. No. Doesn't look like it's going at 80. All right. Is it uniform? No. No. Nope. And is there a matching cloth wave at 80, like it should be? No. No. There's a matching cleft wave with what's going on underneath, but there's not one with the pacing, right? Right. We want that to be what? 80. We want that to be 8 in this particular <clears throat> case. All right. And pulse ox is only picking up 42. All Don't know about change in shape, we gotta think about it. All right, wide and bizarre T wave, or wide and bizarre QRS and a T wave. Yeah, I would say we probably do have one there with every QRS, good. Is it going at the selected rate? So is it going off at 70? Yeah. Is it uniform in between, meaning there's no extra beats going on in between? No, no extra beats, so it is uniform. And matching plug wave. No, because they don't have it on there. But they probably do have it on, it's just not on their screen. Because it's picking up a number up here. So they probably have it on. But if you don't have it on the screen in one of the settings, it's just going to give you the actual oxygen saturation number. It's not going to give you you're not going to be able to see if it's correlating with each QRS. All right. All right. Same thing. Change in shape. Don't know. Wide and bizarre with a large T wave. No. Is it pacing at the selected rate? Is it going at 80 like we want it to? Nope. Is it uniform, meaning that it's the same in between each beat, nothing else happening? No, there's some stuff. There's some stuff happening in between. And 
and do we have a matching pathway? <coughs> it would be nice to know, but they don't even have it on. There's no number in the corner, it means that they haven't even put it on, so they have no idea. Right? That one little device would change everything with this patient. Also, what are some other things that look weird with this one? Remember, this is, this is them saying, hey man, we're good to go. We have it, we're good to go. It's only at 45. What was the average we said? 120. 120, and they're at 45. That should throw off alarm bells, like, hey, you're only at 45. You should be a lot higher. That's why we've switched and we start at 80. It starts at 80 beats a minute, and you have 80 milliamps right out the gate, and you go up from there. So we can avoid all of this now. All right. A couple more. Don't know about changing shape, but we want to think about it. Whoop. All right. There is no wide and bizarre QRS and a large T wave associated. Is it going at the selected rate? Is it pacing at 80? Well, I would say the pacer is actually still firing at 80, right? I would say it is. It doesn't mean it's capturing at 80, but it is still shooting off at 80. It's delivering energy at a rate of 80 beats a minute. Is it uniform in between? No, there's extra stuff going on, right? And do I have a matching plus wave? Oh man, this is, this is, what do you think? So, this is an interesting one. Right, there's a lot going on on that screen, okay? I can definitively tell you that this is their underlying rhythm right here. And we've learned that you shouldn't have your underlying rhythm continuing if we are successfully capturing, or successfully pacing it. Shouldn't happen, right? I can also tell you that on the, up in the corner over here, they have a capnography of eight. Those are dead people. You cannot live at a capnography of eight. So if there's a capnography of eight, you're probably dead. Or they pulled the sensor off, right? right? Uh, it does say that they are at a rate of 80, so this could be a bunch of different things, right? This could even be someone starting CPR. And you're getting enough, they're not picking it up on the machine, but they're picking it up on the pulse ox. Could be it. That's why we have a checklist. So you can have some yeses and some noes. We want all yeses, or at least question mark and yeses. We don't want X's on there. Does that make sense? That's why we have the checklist. So you can just walk down it and we're good to go. I think they're dead. I've cropped some of it out. You can't see it on my screen for some reason. But we talked about the arrows up here are the underlying rhythm or the machine picking up your QRS. What are the arrows down here indicating? There should be some arrows at the bottom. What does that indicate? The arrows at the bottom is where it, you are delivering energy. So arrows at the very bottom are showing what you're doing. Arrows at the top show what the machine is picking up you doing. All right, a couple more. We're almost done with it. All right, don't know about changing shape. Do I have a wide and bizarre QRS or a T wave? With all of them, no, I don't think so, right? Is it going at the selected rate of 70? Yeah, I think it's going off at 70. Is it uniform in between? No, no. There are some things that looks weird going off in between, right? 
And do I have a matching plug plate? No. So either they have this on and this person's dead, or they haven't even put it on yet. All right. Any questions with the EKGs we just went through? You've seen how if you use that checklist and walk all the way through it, every time you're going to pay somebody and get all checks to confirm, we're probably pretty good. But what's the one thing that we didn't have on there to check for? What haven't we even talked about yet? And it's on the screen. Not really blood pressure, but what do we do after we get electrical capture? Mechanical capture. Mechanical, mechanical capture. We haven't even talked about mechanical capture. And the reason why is because we want you to go through this entire thing first, then feel for mechanical capture. Because you might get in that false capture situation where pace or spike, QRS, I feel a pulse. And when the epi is coursing through your brains and through your head, you're not going to think, oh, well, it's only going to 40. You're just going to say, I got a pacer spike, I have a QRS, and I have a, a pulse down here in my femoral. We're good to go. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So you get all of this first, then you go and you feel for your femoral pulse. Right? Do you have a question? Was, so what did your pulse so match up with the QRS of being paced? Like you wouldn't have to like really count as long as it's matching up with each QRS? Um... If you have full, all right, so the question is, would your plef match up with the pacer? Is that what you're saying? Oh, so like, let's say I get capture 80, and I'm feeling for the pulse. Like, well, I feel for, like, mechanical capture. I'm feeling to feel the pulse from them and watch the QRS at the same time. Right. So, right. But, match. right. But if what we're trying to avoid is those situations where you're in that, fan, or that false capture situation, mm -hmm. Because you would feel, you would feel, it would all associate, okay. it would just be going at 40. But subconsciously you would think, well, I'm checking all the boxes. I have a pacer spike, I have a QRS, I have a, a pulse. We're good to go. Okay. It should, your femoral pulse should match whatever your pacer is set at. Not what their underlying rhythm is set at, right? Yeah. Okay. Blood pressure. We get a lot of people that comment on, well, I'm pacing and my, their blood pressure came up with this, so I'm obviously successful, right? Tell me, do you think this is painful? Has anybody ever seen it? Like any of the EMTs ever actually seen someone getting paced? It literally, they're, they're jerking the entire time and it is not comfortable. So what do you think the body's response to that would be? So they're gonna get a response and their blood pressure might momentarily come up Right? Because, dude, this hurts. But that's not actually a blood pressure that's going to be sustained. So, again, that blood pressure will be transient. It will increase, and when that, that response, that epi dump they get from the pain wears off, it will come back down. So don't just rely solely on your blood pressure coming up. Right? Also, think about it. How do we, how does that blood pressure cuff actually work? Does anybody know how it works? Nate, you know how it works? What's it doing when it's taking that blood pressure on the machine? It's causing pressure. What's it listening for? Your actual, your beat coming through the brake water. It's listening for a vibration, right? So if I'm jerking around, right? Much like you driving down the road and it's bouncing, it's not gonna give you an accurate reading. And they are they know that they are not accurate at the very low ends and the very high ends. Right? They're good in between when you're sitting still, but at the extremes, they're not real accurate. So get a manual if you have to. Right? But don't just solely rely on the blood pressure being your, oh, we're good to go. Alright? First said is our choice right now for our pain management. So you would just give 2.5 milligrams of Versed right, as needed walking them through the process, getting them to the hospital. Now, the question will come up. When do I give it? When do I actually give the Versed? Because this is a very painful process. And that is really up to you and how comfortable you feel. We don't want you doing anything that you are not comfortable with. 
So if your mindset, which is actually the one I would go with, is get successful capture, get improvement, and then give them the burst ed. Or if you're comfortable, you can give them the burst ed prior to pacing because your medical director is comfortable <coughs> with you doing that as well. So you do it whatever you're comfortable with. Um, and pacing doesn't always work. Everything we do in the fire service and in EMS is there's always like a backup plan, right? If I can't get an IV and I need one, well, I can go to an IO. If I can't get an innovation, well, I just go to an IJO. Pacing's no different. If pacing doesn't work, and sometimes it doesn't, we have to move on to a different step, okay? So for the paramedics here, can you tell me what rhythm that is right there? And this is not, no judgment passed, right? Like this is, this is a tough one. But for the medics, can you tell me what rhythm that is? And this is the best one that I could really come up with that was definitive. So like an atrioventricular? Uh, you're getting close. Or junctional? You're picking up on something that would, yeah. You're, you're, you're show you're <clears throat> you're noticing the lack of P waves. Yeah, and right? wide. And it's wide. Right? It's almost like it's almost getting to like the ridiculous wide. Almost like I'm stretching it out and like pulling a string and stretching it out and everything's kind of blurring and merging together. Right? And then if I were to describe the T waves and lead four and five, I would say that they're a little peaky. Oh, uh, well, hyper This is hyperkalemia. So pacing will not work on somebody that is in hyperkalemia. Now we're not talking about giving calcium, or we're, we're talking about why pacing wouldn't work. And the reason why is pacing isn't a free Beat. It's not actually going in there and squeezing your heart for you. You still have to have your electrolytes in balance and the calcium on one side and the sodium on one side. If those are misbalanced or off balance, then it's still not going to work no matter what you do to it, right? So we run on people like this a lot. So if it's not going to work, what's another way that I am going to increase their blood pressure or make their heart go faster. Pressure. Pressure. Some sort of pressing agent, right? Something, something else, right? So if pacing doesn't work and you walk through the process and it doesn't work, fine. More about recognition or more, we care more about you finding out, oh, this isn't right, this isn't working and moving to the next step. So we would go right to our push dose epi, all right? So it would be um, one milliliter a minute for 30 minutes of push dose epi, one to 100,000. Does everybody know how to make that? EMTs, have they showed you that in EMS week yet, where the, at least that bag is? Mm -hmm. yes, sir. They should be set together, so you just have to hand the bag. That's the goal. <clears throat> Instead of having to pull the pieces and put them together, they should be all in the bag, should be, right? Another one, capnography. Use your capnography. Use your capnography. So we should have our pulse ox on, and we should have capnography on. And capnography really serves two very important purposes. Number one, right? it should show you when you have your actual mechanical capture. So you should have a low capnography because you're hypotensive and you're not bringing a lot of blood back to the lungs, right? So you're not off-gassing a lot of CO2. And the second I start returning all of that stuff, because I have a good blood pressure pulling it back, it should come back up. So you should have a moment or a time where it's here and now it's here. So it's great for you to determine. Another one is, is some people are worried about when they're pacing that they could go into cardiac arrest and then not know about it because the machine's still going underneath, right? Well, if I have catenography on, I can very clearly see when they go from breathing 
to not breathing. And people that are in cardiac arrest don't breathe. So that's a way for you to determine, oh, now their capnography is gone. I need to check and see what's going on. What do I do if I want to see the underlying rhythm without any obstructions? What can I do? Pause. Hit the pause button. And what the pause button is supposed to do, it's supposed to go down to 25% of the pacing rate, but maintain the same energy value. So if you're pacing at 80, it'll go down to 20 just so that you get, you can see what's going on there, right? Now, if they switch from capture to cardiac arrest, it might then switch from a good wide QRS complex or whatnot back to one of those phantom situations where you just see the electrical energy and nothing else happens. So that would be a change in shape again. Right? It's not going to rock off and look the same even when they're in cardiac arrest. Does that make sense? All right. All right, here is our protocol for our symptomatic bradycardia. So let's just make sure we understand at the end of this when we actually want to do the pacing and when we don't want to do it. So we wouldn't want to pace somebody that is not having some sort of issue related to their bradycardia. So if they're a marathon runner and their heart rate at rest is 40 and their blood pressure is 120 over 80 and they're talking to you and everything's good, we don't have to put them on the pacer and start lighting them up, right? right. They have to have some sort of symptom related to it and what most likely is the symptom going to be, you think? What do you think? And that's all going to be related probably to a very low blood pressure, right? I get altered because my heart is not pumping enough blood to my brain, so my blood pressure is low, right? So most of it is associated with that, most of it, okay? When we say altered mental status, we don't mean, hey, what's today? Oh, man, today is, I think today's Wednesday. No, bam! No, that's not, <laughs> that's not enough, right? Like, right? Okay, so, blood pressure. They're having blood pressure issues, okay? Uh, also, we have medicines that can fix some of our slow heart rates and we have electricity for the other ones. So the non-lethal ones like sinus brady, junctional, right? Those can be fixed by medication. And our medication of choice for those is our atropine. And remember, it's switched from 0.5 to one milligram now. So if they're in like a sinus brady and we have to treat them because they're symptomatic, then we would give them the atropine for some of those non-lethal rhythms. Now, when we get to the bad ones, second degree type two, third degree idioventricular, that, those are electrical issues and we have to fix that with electricity. So that's when we go to pacing. There's one other time where we go to pacing pretty much right away and that's in the presence of a stent, so they have their bradycardic, we hook up a 12 lead, and we notice that they're having a stent. For those people, we're gonna put the pads on and we're gonna pace if we need to. Why? Why have we chosen that path? The heart rate the stress, I had this once, it's screwed up. <clears throat> um, your, your heart's not functioning, you already have a cardiac issue, and they're very hypersensitive, and you can't get your blood pressure up or nothing. Right. Also, <clears throat> Nate, if I were to give that person atropine, where is their heart rate going to end? How yeah. high is it going to you get? You have no idea. And I don't have a clue. Atropine, you, give it. you have no idea what's going to be. I have no clue. I could give atropine and it could go to from 40 to 50, 40 to 80, 40 to 150. I don't know. And I don't want to ramp that heart up more than what I have to to maintain blood flow to the brain because it's already dying. So I don't want to increase the workload. So we say, fine, we will set it at exactly the point that we want it. So we go to pace it. Okay. I'll tell you that when someone's having a heart attack, as long as they're getting blood flow to the brain and they're conscious and they're talking to you, I would let a lot of that just ride out, right? Because I don't want to have to do more work to the heart. On the machine, you can get your mean arterial pressure, your MAP. It's in the corner where the blood pressure is. 
and it'll give you the systolic, diastolic, and then it gives you another number, and that's your MAP. And you need about 60 to maintain good perfusion to your brain. So as long as you're hovering right there, and they're talking to you, and they're awake and breathing, good. When they dip past that point is when you really want to take over and someone's having a cardiac issue. Because I don't want to make the heart do more than it really has to to get into the hospital, right? <clears throat> Just going over again, the success cases so you can see and get a general overview of what they look like. So here's a good one, but it doesn't have our pulse ox on there. So that would be great to have it on that one. Um, another good one, we've seen this a couple times. Good pulse ox, right? Wide and bizarre, T wave, right? All right. Here's one where we're not really sure. I don't know if these are kind of lining up or not, but they have a wide, bizarre QRS, T wave. The machine's saying that it's going at 78 on the pulse ox, and they're set at 80, so that's close enough. And here we go. Pulse ox is not visible, but it is on. Because you can they have a number in the corner up there. Alright. Alright. Any questions? Now's your time. Now you know how to walk through a step-by-step -step process to determine if you're successful or not. You know kind of the key points on hey, well, I understand what phantom capture is. I understand what false capture is. I know how to avoid them. EMTs, you now know all the tools that we will need. So a paramedic shouldn't have to ask you, hey, put, the, put them on the pulse ox. Put them on the four lead. You know we're going to need those things if we're gonna be pacing somebody, right? Now, a good way to handle that too is, hey, do you want me to put on this pulse ox for you, right? And they'll probably be like, yeah, okay, cool. Th thank you, thank you. But it's all a team effort here, and we're all part of the same team. And believe me, when a paramedic is going through that, they have got a lot of stuff on their mind. Like this person's dying in front of them, they gotta figure out how to pace them, they gotta get an IV, they gotta get this. And if you notice something's going on, you could say, hey, well, don't forget this, or don't forget that, we're all at it together. Don't stand back and go, oh, well, they're the paramedic, eh, sorry, right? Uh, it's not how this works, it's not how this works. And you wouldn't want it to be that way when you all go to medical school and become PICs yourself. So, all right, thank you. Hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully the paramedics in the room are like, woo, I'm never gonna mess this up ever, right? But understand, if you do, we have other ways to do it, right? We have, if it's unsuccessful, you can move on to something else, all right?